All right, everybody, welcome to this Meeting of the Minds discussion. I'm joined here with our th three speakers, Philip Goff, Rupert Sheldrake, and Paul Kingsnorth. The topic of today is going to be religion without belief. And to get started, I'm just going to ask the first question. So the first thing I'd like to ask is, how did each of you arrive at your current religious or spiritual understanding? And maybe you want to, if you've had any sort of profound spiritual or religious experiences that have, that have impacted you, maybe this would be a good point to, to discuss those two. So let's, um, let's start with, uh, with Paul here, if you don't mind. Sure. What is um? How long have you got? Um, <laughs> it's a, it's kind of a lifetime's journey, really. Um, I can say, I mean, look at, at this point. I am an Orthodox Christian, and I'm intending to remain an Orthodox Christian because that's the it turns out to be the um the place I was walking towards. And of course, when you become a Christian, which I've only I've only been baptized for two years, you realise that's not the end of the journey; it's the beginning. So um, I've I've just started again, if you like. But what what's happened to me is that um. I think for the last 25 years or so, I've been on a, I've been on a, a, a quest. I've been on a spiritual quest, if you like. I don't really like the word spiritual, but I haven't got a better one. Um, and it really started for me with um, my experiences in nature as a child, which um, were very profoundly, uh, I suppose, as, again, spiritual, but I didn't have the language or the words for that. I didn't grow up in a religious family. I didn't know what was going on, but I would spend a lot of time with my dad, especially in the mountains and in the, and in the hills for weeks on end. And that would have a profound effect on me. And I had a strong sense that there was something very powerful and inexplicable and very much bigger than me that I was experiencing. I didn't know what to do with that. Um, and for a long time, I sort of channeled it into environmental activism. I wanted to protect the natural world, not for rational reasons due to arguments about carbon or whatever, but because I had a sense that something really sacrilegious was going on when we were destroying um, the natural world, destroying sites of great beauty. I was having, a, uh, as I say, a spiritual relationship with those things. But I, I had to work my way through for a long, long time to work out what was going on um, when I was in my... 40s it became much more of a conscious spiritual quest i practiced buddhism for quite a long time i then i felt there was something missing from that and i realized to my horror that what was missing was god because i didn't want to believe in god um but i did and i thought i needed to work out what was going on because i could feel something was happening and i ended up because i was a nature lover i decided to look for a nature religion and i spent a lot of time studying mythology and going on vision quests in the hills and i ended up um, as a Wiccan, I ended up as a Wiccan priest, actually joining a Wiccan coven around these parts um, of all things. And I lasted a couple of years there. Uh, interesting things happened, um, but there was still something wrong with it. And at some point, um, at some point, I, I just wanted to know what the truth was. And I actually remember very particularly at getting on my knees in the garden. I thought, when you want to know what the truth is, you have to get on your knees. So I got on my knees in the garden and I said, OK, God, if you exist, I want to know what the truth is. Why don't you take me to where the truth is? I'm trying to get the timeline right. But it really wasn't long after that when I had a very strange dream in which I, I saw Jesus, which uh, was not intended to, wasn't the plan. I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't looking for Christianity at all. And when I spoke to God, I didn't have particularly the Christian perception of God in mind. But that was what happened. And then all sorts of odd things happened. I, Christians kept coming out of the woodwork at me. Um, I was a writing teacher at the time. I kept getting Christians coming to me to want to talk about their writing. Um, I had more experiences. I had more dreams. And then I, at one point, I had a very, very powerful, very strange experience um, in which I was, I've written about this in an essay I wrote called The Cross and the Machine. Um, and I was in, I was actually at a concert with my son. He was a music, playing in a music concert. And I just suddenly had this enormous, overwhelming feeling of, of to use that horrible word, oneness. And, and love for everybody in the room, which is not normal for me. I, I don't generally love everybody <laughs> in whatever room I'm in, but it really was entirely overwhelming. And I knew it was Christ and it was very disturbing. And I had to accept that I was becoming a Christian. And after that, it was a question of finding out what that meant. Uh, and I wanted to find, I wanted to find what the oldest Christian tradition was and what the truest one was and what the one was that had the real uh, mystical connection to what I thought I'd experienced. And that was what brought me, uh, to the Orthodox Church, to put cut a long story short. So it's a very strange story. Um, but since I wrote about it, I've discovered that it's a story that happens to many other people. Lots and lots of people write to me and say, I can't believe that happened to you. Similar things happened to me. Lots of people from a sort of similar sort of leftist, secular, eco-y sort of background and all sorts of other backgrounds too. 
say that. Um, so that was that was what brought me here. And if you told me five years ago that this is what I was going to be saying on a podcast, I would have been surprised to say the least. But that, that's where I am. I had to follow what happened, and, and so it's brought me here. And as I say, it's, it almost feels like the beginning of an exploration now, rather than the end of one. Brilliant, Paul. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, Rupert, do you want to go next there? Yes. Um, I was brought up by a Christian family. My parents and grandparents were Methodists. Uh, my <clears throat> grandfather was the church organist. My uncle was the church organist and choir master. And I went to an Anglican boarding school. So I had a fairly conventional Christian upbringing. And it was entirely benign. I was a chorister in the school choir. I loved the Anglican church music tradition. By the time I was about 14 or 15, I was doing science at school, and it became clear to me that my science teachers thought that religion was a waste of time. It was just a thing of the past. Science was a thing of the future. No scientist could possibly believe in God. And so I bought into standard scientific materialism and atheism, which were a very common package that teenagers buy into at around that age. And when I went to Cambridge as an undergraduate, I was uh, you know, definitely in the atheist camp. Um, and uh, stayed so as a graduate student at Cambridge. And then I began to wonder about bigger questions. In 1968, I was working in Malaysia, in the University of Malaya, in the botany department. On the way there, I spent two or three months traveling through India, and I was amazed by Indian culture, this extraordinarily rich culture, these amazing temples, pilgrimages everywhere, holy men, I met sadhus, and when I was in Malaysia, I met Buddhists and, 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 and Hindus and Christians and Muslims. It gave me a very different view of religion and its power in people's lives. When I got back to Cambridge, I also explored psychedelics. I think I took LSD for the first time around 1971, and that opened up for me a whole realm of consciousness I didn't know about and made me interested in consciousness. I took up transcendental meditation and yoga. And then several years later, took a job in India because I was so fascinated by Indian culture. I worked as an agricultural plant physiologist in an international crop research institute. And I went to Hindu ashrams, I went to temples, I went to discourses by gurus, I read the Upanishads or commentaries on them, and was very into Hindu philosophy. But then I just felt that this wasn't the right thing for me. I wasn't Indian. And when one of my Hindu colleagues said to me, you know, why do you do this work? Why do you work for these poor farmers and try and improve the lot of poor farmers? And I said, because they're poor and, and they need help. He said, that is not your business. He said, that is their karma. That is not your business. Your business is to achieve liberation from samsara, from the wheels of reincarnation and and you know a kind of vertical takeoff model that the hindus and and the theravada buddhists have and i realized actually i was much more christian than i thought and i started praying i was then confirmed in the church of south india and i then found a wonderful um teacher in the form of father bede griffiths who was an english benedictine monk who was running a, a syrian orthodox ashram in tamil nadu in south india uh, later became a Benedictine ashram, but he went to India through the Orthodox Church. And he was a marvellous teacher. I lived there for two years, and I wrote my first book, A New Science of Life, about morphic resonance when I was living in his ashram. When I got back to England, I found that these things I so liked in India, holy places, pilgrimages, a sense of the sacred, sacred chanting, uh, were all here in England. I just simply blinded myself to them. Um, my father had taken me when I was a child to almost every English cathedral, and I had a deep attachment to these places. Then I realized that by I could go on pilgrimages in England, I could go to great cathedrals, these wonderful holy places, reconnect with my own tradition. So uh, I became a regular church-going Anglican. And since then, um, I've continued in that path. Um, exploring the Christian mystical traditions, um, the, the Christian mystical writers I have several friends who are theologians and, and, and mystics that I discuss these with. And I've also helped found the British Pilgrimage Trust, which is reopening the ancient footpath pilgrimage routes in England. And now a whole series of one day pilgrimage routes to 
all our great cathedrals. I would say then that I, a little bit like Paul, I've returned to Christianity via Oriental uh, religions. And, and, and so I don't, uh, I still learn and, and from them. And my wife is a, has a, um, a Dzogchen practitioner in the Tibetan Dzogchen Buddhist um, tradition. So I'm certainly open to other traditions. I think they have a great deal to offer. Uh, but my own particular path is Anglican Christianity. That's that's an incredible journey you've been on, Rupert. Um, thanks for sharing as well. Now, Philip, do you want to give us give us your your story as well, please? Yeah, I'm not sure it's quite so dramatic, but uh, I was raised Catholic in a very vibrant uh, church community in Liverpool. But by the time I was 14, I decided I was an atheist and refused to get confirmed. Very much upset my grandmother. My mum sent me to the priest who tried Pascal's wager on me, but I, I wasn't very convinced. And then I, for about 20 years after that, I think I didn't have anything to do with religion at all. And then I think in, in my early 30s, I guess I started to feel, maybe with my wilder days behind me, uh, I started to feel the absence of the things I'd really valued in my religious upbringing, the way, the way in which it uh, binds the community together with shared traditions, with uh, rituals that mark the seasons and the, and the big moments of life, birth, coming of age, marriage, death. Um, I sort of really, really began to miss that the, the value of those things. And so these reflections took me um, shortly before Christmas one year, about 10 years ago, to uh, Liverpool Cathedral. I was living in the center of Liverpool at the time, uh, my first job as a lecturer in Liverpool University, which is also where I'm from, but it was just actually sheer chance, you know, when you're an academic, you apply everywhere. And I just happened to end up going back to Liverpool. Um, and it was a beautiful service, you know, beautiful even song. And um, the, the Anglican Cathedral, this was rather than the Catholic Cathedral. And, you know, it took me to places I hadn't been for a long time. And I stayed for coffee after the service. I was chatting to the, the minister. I was saying, you know, was, I, I got so much out of the service, but, you know, I don't know how literally I can take the claims of Christianity. And I was completely blown away by his answer, actually. He said, well, I'm a, I'm a quite conservative Christian. I think Jesus rose from the dead and left an empty tomb. But it's it's totally fine to be a Christian that takes things less literally. And he gave me books by Karen Armstrong, books by Marcus Borg. And I came to, through reading, came a fight to find a way of engaging with Christianity as a profound metaphor, um, revealing not just truths about the human condition, but I think revealing spiritual truths. I think when we reflect on this story in which God is not identified with the king in the castle, but with the naked executed peasant, you know, the guy who was born in a barn and hung out with outcasts. And um, I think this reveals something deep and true and real. Um, so, so I returned to religion, I guess, as a, as a, as an, a non-literalist engagement with the spiritual practice, with the community. And, and that worked very well for me. I think over those 10 years, I think I've slowly maybe be become open to um, more literalist, mildly heretical versions of Christianity. So, so what, what, what's always been a staple for me, I think, for a long time is I don't believe in God in the very traditional sense, what philosophers call the omni-God all-knowing, all-powerful, perfectly good. And for a familiar reason, I, I, I just find very compelling the arguments from evil and suffering. It, it doesn't seem to me plausible a loving, all-powerful God would create the world we find ourselves in. Beautiful and wonderful as it is, it's also full of so seemingly so much unnecessary suffering. So I don't believe in that traditional God. But actually, as I've talked to uh, more people, I've, I've, I've realized that there are ways of interpreting Christianity that maybe depart from that very traditional idea of God, um, pantheistic or panentheistic versions of Christianity, where the, the universe is part of God. Um, maybe, and maybe God 
because of a more intimate relationship with the universe is constrained and isn't all powerful in the way we in the way we traditionally think maybe, maybe god's made the best universe she can so i think i've slowly moved from um a sort of non-literalist to a what i call a practicing agnostic i'm really not sure either way but i'm, I'm more open to those interpretations of christianity and i think perhaps i engage with it as um in a, in a spirit of hopeful commitment and, and just more generally living in hope that there is a purpose to existence and that what I do in small in some small way contributes to that greater purpose. I find that a very meaningful way to live and keeps my ego in check a little bit. And um, yeah, I found that a very meaningful way to live. And just finally, I suppose you asked about experiences. I suppose even in those 20 years when I had nothing to do with religion, I suppose I still... I've always had some kind, like many people, most human beings do, a sense of a, a, a greater reality at the core of things. Something I have, I've never had a full-blown mystical experience as uh, uh, Rupert and Paul have had seemingly um, from what they describe. I'm not sure, I say seemingly because I'm not sure they'd quite want to say mystical experience, but something along those lines. But sort of fleeting experiences I find often with morning and evening light, some sense of a greater reality. And I've come to think philosophically that it's quite rational to trust those experiences. You know, some people say, well, they, ju they could just be delusions, funny things going on in your brain. And of course, the answer to that is, of course, it could be. But so could any experience. You know, I don't think of my ordinary experience that there's a table here right now. I can't get outside of my consciousness to check. I think all knowledge is just rooted in choosing to trust experiences. And I don't see any good reason to think oh, you can trust your ordinary sensory experiences, but you can't trust your spiritual experiences, especially those ones that are quite cross-culturally pervasive in the way ordinary sensory experiences are. Um, okay, so I guess that's, that, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm up to at the moment, a sort of practicing agnostic. Thanks very much for sharing that, Philip. Um, so, something you said there, uh, I'm kind of curious about. So you, you mentioned that one of the obstacles for you to f like fully believing in Christianity was a problem of evil. And um, I'd be curious to ask now, Rupert and Paul, you know, how would you respond, respond to that? And how would you respond to someone who says that they couldn't believe in God because of the problem of evil? Okay, um, well, first of all, I think this idea of God as a, the omni God as the creator of a totally perfect loving universe is not the traditional Judeo-Christian view of God at all. The Old Testament God is thoroughly unpleasant in many places, you know, sending curses upon Egypt, the author of many forms of evil, um, and is certainly not a, a loving God who's uh, everything's perfect and stuff. It's, so I think I see it as a rather sentimental view of God, the, the so-called conventional view that you're rejecting. Um, um, I certainly don't have that view of God, um, and it's certain, there's certainly evil and, and suffering and pain in the world. Um, my view of God is, I would say, traditional in the sense that it's the Holy Trinity. It's the the uh, creative Trinity, a consciousness with uh, internal differentiation, which gives rise to this world. And God's creation of the world is not as in post-17th century mechanistic theology, a divine engineer who perfectly engineers animals and plants. The first chapter of Genesis says, and God said, let the earth bring forth plants that give fruit after their kind. Let the seas bring forth uh, living creatures. And um, so it's, it's uh, imp God empowers nature with a creativity, which is expressed, we now think, in terms of the evolutionary process. But there's nothing there about God making everything perfect. There's an autonomy in nature. And I think that the divine providence is more about God preventing things going too far in, in destructive directions because of destructive tendencies inherent in nature itself. And it has to have destructive tendencies, death um, and, and decomposition of part of life, uh, supernovas, exploding stars, the expanding universe. It's an unstable universe. Um, and so I think of providence as drawing things towards the good rather than uh, a divine 
uh, creator who got everything right in the first place. And if he didn't get it right, then we blame God. As C.S. Lewis once said, the, the old idea was that God was the judge of humans. The modern idea, in, especially in secular circles, is that humans are the judge of God. You know, if God's so good, why did he create suffering and evil in the world? And why, why are the mosquitoes? Um, um, that is actually rather a modern kind of question and, and not a traditional one. Yeah, that's Thank really you. interesting. Um, I was just struck with when you were talking about Genesis there. So God creates the earth in six days, as we know, and then he rests on the seventh. And at the end of a lot of those days, you read in Genesis, he creates uh, the, the, the the animals and, he, and it says, and God saw that it was good. But there are two days when he didn't see that it was good. And the first one is the day when he separates the, the land from the waters, which is quite interesting. I don't exactly know what that is, but there's some sort of separation between opposites there. God doesn't see that that's good. The other day that he doesn't see that it's good is when he creates humans. Okay, it does. <laughs> who are created last, by the way, which is one thing that Christians and Darwin agree on. Humans yeah. come last. We're very young. Um, and God doesn't see that that's good because we're very imperfect. And then, then you go into the story of the Garden of Eden. And what happens in the Garden of Eden? We are informed right from the first that we have a free will. We have a choice. We can do what we like. Um, which is one answer to the so-called problem of evil as well, because, you know, you have a choice. You have a choice what to do. If you didn't have a choice, you'd be automatons and God would be controlling. I mean, how how would it be possible for some divine consciousness to, to prevent people from doing all the bad things if, if he wasn't somehow micromanaging you? If you're going to have free will, evil is going to happen. But the other thing that's that's worth talking about, because I, I completely agree with Rupert, this, this is quite a modern notion. It's quite a sort of post-Reformation or maybe post-Enlightenment notion that there's a perfect divine clockmaker and it's his fault if everything's not lovely. Um, I mean, if you look at, say, the Orthodox faith or, or indeed the medieval Christian worldview, there's a spiritual war going on. OK, I mean, this is absolutely right at the heart of, 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 the, of the Orthodox worldview, the traditional Christian worldview. You have a bunch of fallen angels who rebel against God, led by the adversary, the Satan, as he's called in the in the Bible, and they fall and they create this, this kingdom of, of opposition to God. It's those forces that tempt us away from God. We're, we're made in communion in this garden, and we're so close to everything else that lives. We're so close to God that we can see him walking in the garden. So there's this great image of us in communion with all life and with the divine creator of life, whatever that quite is. And we choose to walk away from that. We choose to go our own way to make ourselves gods because we're following this force. So like Rupert says, there are these there were these opposites tugging each other all the time. There's always a spiritual war. There's God, there's the anti-God, there's the adversary, there's the Satan, there's the demons, there's God and the angels. And these are all ways of speaking about this spiritual war that's always going on, um, which comes to a head at the end of time, you know, when things are remade. This is the Christian story. So the Christian story has a deep kind of really strong mythic content to it, which I, I think is very much bleached out by the sort of modern version of Christianity, which as you say, it has a kind of nice God in the sky and we just have to be good and hopefully we go to heaven after we're dead. And so how come there are bad things then? You know, which is what I used to see as Christianity. One of the things that shocked me when I discovered the Orthodox faith is that, which after all is the original Christian faith of the West as well as the East really, because there was no Orthodox or Catholic or anything else for the first thousand years, is this is the way everybody used to see everything here. Um, and, and I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that was what Christianity was, but it turns out to be quite a different pattern so that that idea of um this spiritual war raging it's raging inside our hearts all the time as well that's what we're all supposed to be fighting so so the battle is this kind of inner battle to um to choose the right side if you like all the time and, and i find that very enlightening it makes a lot of sense to me given the, what i see around me in the world you know because i agree with you if, if we did think that god was all perfect and all loving and created a perfect and loving world wouldn't be possible to explain all the the everyday horrors but but it makes a lot more sense from that perspective. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so next, the next thing I'd sort of like to cover would be from from your point points of view, what do you think the costs are of our increasing drive towards sec secularization as a society? You know, and can human beings live well without religion, both individually and collectively? Um, so, Philip, if you want to maybe take this, take this one. Yeah, and well, I mean, I, I'm inclined to think in many ways the religion of our time is scientism, by which I mean uh, the view that the only things we're allowed to believe in are those 
that can be demonstrated on the basis of observation and experiments. Now, if you sort of zealously adhere to that creed, you will end up, if you do it consistently, you will end up not believing in your own conscious experience because your own conscious experience is not something you know about. You know, consciousness isn't something we discovered in a particle collider or looking down a microscope. You can't look in someone's brain and see their feelings and experiences. We know about consciousness in a very different way through our immediate awareness of our own feelings and experiences. If you're in pain, it's just directly there for you. So, that, I mean, the philosopher, scientistic philosopher Daniel Dennett is wonderfully consistent in this. He appreciates that his ex conscious experience is not a postulate of public experiments and observation, so he doesn't believe in it. Um, so I think we're in a, in a very peculiar phase of history where, um, I, you know, I, I believe ultimately, it's a huge debate, obviously, but what I've argued for in my academic work is that our, our official worldview is inconsistent with the reality of conscious experience. And, um, you know, and it's conscious experience that makes life worth living, you know, pleasure and, you know, beautiful sensory experiences or our conscious understanding of what things are and what they mean. That's what human life is all about. So we're in this very strange period of history where our official worldview rules out that which is most evident, really, and that which gives life meaning and significance. Another example, I think, our official scientific worldview cannot accommodate the reality of value. And yet I think value is something we encounter. I think we, we know human trafficking is, is abhor abhorrent, objection, objectively abhorrent. And yet our official worldview tells us, I think, you know, really, really there's no such thing as value. Maybe at best it's, it's just a matter of how individual people happen to feel about things. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a tension at the, in our current moment between um, what we're officially supposed to believe and what we need to believe to live meaningful lives. Um, now, if that was just the truth, then that would be the truth and we just have to get used to it. But I, I, I don't think there's, a, there's any reason to, think, to, to accept this scientific approach that the only things we can, we know to, the only way we can know anything about reality is through experiments. Experiments are a very important way of knowing about reality, but there are other ways of knowing about reality. We know about our experience through our immediate awareness of it. We know about, I would say, mathematical objects, number sets through mathematical intuition. We know about morality and value through another kind of intuition. And there's a certain skepticism, well, why can you trust those experiences? But, well, how can you trust any experience? How can you trust your ordinary sensory experiences? There's a sort of double standard that's applied that I think arises from this sort of scientific ideology. So, I mean, I think what we need to move to is We've, what we've forgotten is the importance of philosophy. And so to, to my mind, the, the task of philosophy is a job of synthesis to take what we know from observation experiments, of course, crucial, but what we know about in other ways through mathematical, moral intuition, introspective awareness of consciousness, and synthesize it all together in a single unified theory of reality. But uh, so I've given you actually the, the problem and the solution, but I think that's the problem that we the scientism forces us into this unnecessarily impoverished conception of reality. That's really interesting, Philip. Um, now, Rupert, I know you've thought a lot about this. You've read two books um, on the benefits of, you know, spiritual practices. So maybe if you want to, you want to take this, take this one next. Well, what's the question? So, you know, what's the, what's the cost of our increasing move towards secularization as a society? Oh, yeah. Can human beings live well without religion? Oh, yes. Well, I think the cost is very great. It leads to social fragmentation. I think it leads to individual isolation and alienation. If we're nothing but the product of a purposeless uh, evolutionary process, if our minds are nothing but the activity of our brains, um, if our memories are nothing but changes inside our skulls that are extinguished at death, if when we die, that's it, um, if mean if rituals, ceremonies, and festivals which have held societies together for all through human history are discredited or ignored or, or simply um, 
dismissed, then there's very little cohesive power, there's very little sense of purpose, there's very little reason for social cohesion. And so I think that all religions perform very important social functions. That's not why I think we should believe in them or accept them. I think they're about a, a direct contact with forms of consciousness beyond our own. But one of the byproducts of religions is thing, a, a series of rituals, beliefs, rites of passage, ceremonies, celebrations, holy days, festivals that hold societies together and give life meaning. Um, in any case, I think that the secular materialist worldview, the basis of scientism, is just scientifically wrong. Uh, uh, in my book, The Science Delusion, I show that it's based on 10 particular dogmas, each of which was an assumption to start with, a simplifying assumption, but hardened into a dogma. And that actually the sciences have grown beyond them. Uh, we're working in terms of a 19th century outmoded scientific framework. The other thing I think is important to, to recognize about secular societies is that the reason they are still tolerable for many people and the reason that they do um, uh, work and uh, not everyone gets depressed, lots of people do, but not everyone does and many people can lead um, pleasant and satisfactory lives in, in a secular and non-religious way. I think that the morality that dominates secular humanism is actually Christian morality. I think that um, modern secular humanists are actually uh, Christian heretics. I think it's a form of Christi uh, Christian heresy. Um, it's, it takes over many aspects of Christianity, and that's why people think it's wrong to be nasty to people of different races and why it's wrong to call gay people queer and bash them up and, and stuff. I mean, the, all this sort of wokeness, tolerance, inclusiveness, which is so important in our society, especially for many young people, um, uh, uh, ethics not derived from scientific materialism, but from the Christian tradition and from applying it um, in, in, in a, perhaps more thoroughgoing ways than Christians did. You certainly don't find these attitudes in China and in India, etc. I mean, wokeness is is utterly alien to traditional conceptions. There's no conception in Hindu society that everyone's fundamentally equal. Um, there are castes, and the whole system is based on a caste system, different roles in society. Um, the classical world and the classical Chinese world are certainly not based on ideas of everyone of equal value. That's an idea that comes out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, that everyone's equal in the sight of God. Um, and so I think that one, the thing that saves the secular world from its worst excesses is, in fact, secularized Christianity. So people are, in some ways, Christian without even being aware that they, they are. Yes, they have all the hard work of following a Christian uh, moral system, of being considerate to others, etc., and trying to include those who are excluded and uplift the poor and downtrodden and so forth. They have all the hard work of Christian morality without the fun, uh, without the, uh, the festivals, the ceremonies, the blessings, uh, and, and the joy that can come through you know, choral even song, wonderful music, visits to cathedrals, uh, mystical experiences, and so forth. Um, so I think they're just doing, it's rather puritanical. It, it has the hard work uh, and, and cuts out the things that make the religion so rewarding and, 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 and helpful and inspiring. 100%. Paul, have you anything to add to this this part? Mm, yeah, that's really good. Um, it's exactly right. I think secularism, secularism always seems like a historical accident. It's something that happened in the West as a result of the Reformation going too far and wars of religion and, and various political settlements and then materialism, enlightenment, industrial revolution. It's a kind of perfect storm. And I agree with, uh, I think Rupert's put it really well, it's a, it is a Christian heresy. Tom Holland's book, Dominion, is very good on this, on, on how Western, um, what, what Philip's talking about as these sort of, um, you know, inherent values are not always inherent values. I mean, it's absolutely true. I mean, in ancient Rome, you know, every the ruling class owned slaves. And by the way, if the men wanted to have sex with their female slaves, that was completely legitimate any time they fancied it. That was completely normal. That was considered to be just common sense. We would not consider that to be common sense today. We would consider that to be a criminal abuse of, of, of another human being. And it's absolutely true. 
that that th these are Christian values. And so what's happened is we've accidentally secularized ourselves almost. We, I think we tried to fill the gap with this scientific materialism. But as Philip says, it doesn't work beyond a certain point because it, it, it has to continually deny what we can all see in front of our faces. I'm always struck by the, the, the kind of horror of scientists having to experiment on animals to try and prove that they're conscious when the rest of us can just experience that by talking to our dog. You know, we know these things. We're having to, we're having to deny the, the reality that's in front of our faces. Um, but what's also happening is I think that we've been kind of running on the fumes of Christian culture for a few generations and the, and, and the petrol's now gone. So we don't have, increasingly younger generations don't even have that kind of remnant knowledge of Christianity that I grew up with. And so there's no particular reason for the values to hold together. And this is the problem I have with this notion of cultural Christianity. And I think it's, I think it's the, the limitation of what, what Philip was talking about earlier as well, is that a lot of people will recognise now, as Philip was saying, that religion, not just Christianity, but religion as a whole, gives you absolutely this, this kind of structure to society. It gives you the... The, the, the wheel of the year, it gives you the festivals, it gives you the sense of community, it gives you the coming together. But that was all built around a, a spiritual core. That was built around a revelation. And that society would not have come into being had not thousands of people been prepared to be martyred for, for a long time to create a Christian culture. That was what they had to ha have at, at the heart of it. So you can't have a religious culture without the, the, the truth that you believe is the truth at the heart of it beyond a certain point, because you're just LARPing, you're just role-playing, you're going, well, I like the stuff that this belief created, but I don't want the belief. Um, and that poses a problem for people who don't think that they believe, right? Because we can see what religion did for us, but we don't want to take the step of saying, well, what if I, what if I believe? I always think of the, the parable of the prodigal son, which is, I don't know, maybe it's the most important parable that, that Christ tells where, you know, you have a a son who goes off into the city and he spends his father's inheritance on, on, on wine and women and song. And the father's waiting for him to come back all the time, but he doesn't go and get him and he doesn't get angry. He just waits. And when the son comes back, he welcomes him, but we're, we're the son and we're still in the city and we we're now hung over and we've spent all our money and the party's over and we've realized we've done something wrong and we want to go back to dad, but we're not sure how he's going to welcome us if we do, or what we're going to feel like, or whether we're going to get uh, told off. But, you know, we have to make that decision. I feel like we're, we're sort of teetering on the brink of something and that doesn't you know, i'm not suggesting we're going to go back and recreate a society that once existed because we're not going to do that but the question is whether any society could last for any length of time without a sense of the divine at its heart because i don't think maybe i'm wrong but i can't think of a society in history anywhere that has not had a sense of of god or gods or the divine in in some way except this one in the west here now which is not lasting and it's not going to work um so I don't think that secularism in, in this materialist, scientific, secular way in which, as Philip says, we have to deny what we see in front of our face. We also have to deny the possibility of God. I don't think it can last. So the question is what happens next, which is a really exciting question, actually. I mean, the other thing I'd add to what Rupert just said is that it's absolutely true, isn't it, that when you have Christian morality without Christianity, it just becomes horrible. And a lot of the sort of so-called social justice stuff around at the moment, it feels like the Sermon on the Mount without God or love or forgiveness in it. You know, you get this very intolerant culture and then everybody on all sides of the political divide is screaming at each other. And it feels like we're all talking about justice and love, but there isn't any. And the other thing that you miss is the relationship with Christ, which is the thing that Christianity is about. Um, it's that kind of, OK, I'm going to try and follow this, even though. I'm not sure about everything. I may have my doubts. I don't quite understand it. It's too big for me, but I'm going to follow the path anyway. That's that kind of stumbling along. And the other thing that, because, because what the, the Christian faith also says, and what Christ says all the time in the Gospels, is, you know, you should try and be perfect like your father is perfect, but you can't manage it on your own. So you need help. You need help. So you have to reach out to God, and God is supposed to help you. But if you don't reach out to God, you're trying to be perfect on your own. <laughs> you're not going to be able to do that because we're all human so we're all stumbling along pretending that we, we want justice and peace and we can't do it so that's 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 the leap of faith right that's that but that's always at the heart of the thing if you don't have that at the heart of the thing you can't have the thing that's how it seems to me and we're just realizing that now but we don't know what to do about it 100 percent. no i might be getting this wrong but i remember he, I, I at least i think i remember hearing an interview with you um a while ago and you were saying you know there's a basic need in human beings for a connection to the divine something something sacred and 
whenever that's not there, whenever you don't have that sort of connection to something bigger than yourself, to God or whatever, whatever, um, something else will fill, will, will fill that vacuum. And in modern culture, that seems to be uh, consumerism and capitalism. Is that, would you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that's basically the conclusion I've come to after 30 years of stumbling about is that, you know, we are going to worship something. There's a throne at the heart of a culture. There's a throne at the heart of a person. So who's going to sit on it? Is it going to be God? Is it going to be Christ? Is it going to be Muhammad? Is it going to be whatever you think is the, the, the manifestation of God? If it's not, it's going to be something else. So maybe it will be scientism, actually. Maybe that's, uh, as Philip says, maybe that's the God. Maybe it is consumer capitalism. Maybe it's the self. I mean, I tend to think in our culture, it's the kind of therapeutic, narcissistic self where we want to become gods and we want to define our own reality and we want to define our own divinity. But those things are kind of all tied up together, I think. They're all humans trying to measure their way to some kind of truth but but what if we're too small to do that what if we can't see the whole reality what if we have to give ourselves up to something else you know you have sacrifice and surrender at the heart of most faiths i think certainly monotheistic faiths and that we hate that nobody wants to do that <laughs> but what if that's the key what if that's what we have to do 100 100 percent. okay right. so sorry, sorry Philip, you wanted to come in didn't you i've been up yep yeah, so can I maybe respond to uh, Paul's earlier point? So I suppose maybe we're starting to get a little bit of possible disagreement, maybe not, in terms of this idea of not being a, non, a, a non-literalist Christian or a, a Christian without belief. So I'd like, to, maybe I can say two things in response to that. So, so firstly, yeah, yeah, I mean, coming back to Marcus Borg, who was, who was a big influence on me, coming to this non-literalist conception of Christianity. So he did, he, he was certainly not someone without a sense of the divine. You know, he believed in this greater reality at the core of things that he thought we had direct experience to. Um, he thought it's, its nature could not be put into words, but we can know it in experience. And that was the heart of his faith. And he thought through the Christian story that involves this incredible inversion of worldly values, that leads to a deep understanding of the true nature of the sacred, the divine. Even though he didn't necessarily literally believe that Jesus was uniquely divine in a way that no other human being was or that Jesus left an empty tomb, he still thought this 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 lead this is not just a story it's it reveals that the truth of the divine so it's one question whether whether um both Reuben and Paul are right that you know without any sense of the divine you know it's all going to fall apart but is is it a more nuanced question whether with that not literalist but in a way tr- believing that Christianity is in a sense true and a true reflection of the divine, um, whether Jesus reveals God to us, um, whether that could play the same role. So that's one thing. I mean, the other thing I wanted to say, though, I mean, I guess that another question is, look, what do, and, and maybe maybe there isn't disagreement here, but what do we say to people who turn up to our church and say, like myself, <laughs> and say either, you know, either I just don't know either way, or or say, look, I, I just don't think these central claims are true, but I want to be part of the community. I want to be, I love the practice. I love the traditions. I, I, I want to be part of it. What do we say to those people? And I, I can't really see a reason not to embrace them. Um, you know, I have a very traditional Christian friend who said to me, you know, I'm very happy what you're doing. You're hearing the word of God, you know, you're, um, and I actually gave, gave a talk at my church last week, actually. They have someone every month to talk about their journey of faith. And it was interesting. There were a couple of non-literalists who thought I was too much of a believer, actually. And then a couple of, um, you know, more traditionally evangelical Christians saying, you know, asking me about, you know, what do you think about prayer? What do you, and the minister who was leading this said, um, you know, I was kept saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a heretic. And he said, oh, I don't like the word heretic. And I, you know, I really appreciated that. So, so, I mean, sometimes you get in, it seems to be pointless conversations about what is a Christian, who can call themselves a Christian, but I don't know, you know, we can use words how we want. We could use Christian to mean, you know, someone who likes sausages or something. The question is, what do we do with these people who on honest intellectual grounds, either 
it's important difference between lacking belief or disbelieving. We, we tend to just blur over that boundary by just saying don't believe. But anyway, there's two different types of non-believers. There's ones who lack belief, who are not sure either way, and those who just disbelieve but still want to be involved. What do we say to those people? And I can't see a reason not to say you're welcome. Um, yeah, well, that's a good, that's a good, yeah, there is an area of disagreement here because I can see a very good reason not to say you're welcome. Um, because Christian doesn't mean anything we want it to mean. It doesn't mean so I like sausages. It means I believe in the truth of Christ. And and as a, you know, I can't help looking back. I mean, look, let's say two things. Firstly, people have been arguing over the nature of Christ since Christ was alive, right? So that's, you know, you can see that in the book of Acts. You can see people arguing about exactly what Jesus was. But there's also a church and there's also a creed. And at the basic level, as Rupert says, to be a Christian is to believe in the Trinity and it's to follow Christ and to believe that Christ is divine. Um, now, if you, if you don't believe that, there's no reason you can't still be inspired by Christ or like Christianity or anything else. No one's going to stop you. Um, but maybe this is the difference between the Orthodox and the Anglican Church. I mean, it wouldn't be possible to become a baptized Orthodox Christian if you didn't believe in the divinity of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have doubts sometimes. It doesn't mean people aren't going to have arguments about things or different theologies, or it's not like everyone has to be a robot and, and recite the Nicene Creed and forget that it was drawn up by a committee, because it was. Um, but it seems to me this is where the faith comes in, right? Um, because we the, the faith requires us to follow something that we can't literally prove to be true through philosophy or science. I can't prove that Christ rose from the dead, obviously. I can't prove that the resurrection was real or what it exactly did. And people have argued about the meaning of that as well. And, and different Christian traditions have a different understanding of it. But if you don't have a if you don't have a, a kind of guardrail over your understanding of what Christianity is, then you haven't got Christianity. It's like any other word. If we decide that the word man or the word woman can mean anything we want them to, then we start getting into sticky waters. And that's a huge argument at the moment, right? Well, I mean, that's <laughs> that's a huge social division going on. So what do words mean? Do they mean anything? They have to mean something. Um, and different churches have different points of view on this. I, I would say there's a difference between people who come into a church and say, well, I've chosen to follow this path, even though I don't know whether I can do it. and I don't know how much of it is real. I don't really understand. I mean, a lot of people don't come into churches for theological reasons. They just they come to the church because they want to, to, to follow God. Or there's any number of reasons people might come in. People don't usually study theology before they come in anyway but i think if somebody says well look i actually don't believe a word of this but i like the songs and the cake afterwards so can i be a christian please i think the answer should be no you can't because otherwise what's the meaning of it it's just a sort of social club i don't see the uh, you know it's it, there's no there's no strength to it there's no core to it there's no you know i i just look back on the two thousand years of people who who confessed christ some of whom were many of whom were martyred and abused for doing it and i think i can't stand here and say well Maybe it was just all nonsense, really, but, you know, I, I, I sort of want to join in. It's like you have to, there has to be, like I say, there has to be a surrender, doesn't there? We have to surrender to something, even if we don't want to. And that might be surrendering to not knowing, you know, not, not exactly knowing. I bet every, I, I very much doubt every priest in the church is, is totally sure about everything all the time. They have plenty of doubts themselves, but are you going to walk the path or not? I think it's probably the question as I see it, but Rupert might have a different idea. Well, I think I do. I, I, you know, being an Anglican, uh, the, the Church of England is the established church, which means by default, everyone in England is a member of it. Um, they're entitled to be baptized, married, etc., in their parish church. And so it's an inclusive, not an exclusive church. Some churches are exclusive, you know, Plymouth, Plymouth Brethren, you know, Roman Catholic, etc. Mm -hmm. You have to join, you're a member. And the Anglican thing is much more broad, and it's literally a broad church. And I think that a lot of people, for example, love going to choral evensong in cathedrals, which I think is one of our greatest cultural uh, heritages and one of the most beautiful and inspiring things that happens in our land. I love going to choral evensong in cathedrals myself. And um, indeed, I helped set up a website called choralevensong.org, where you can find a choral even song near you any day of the week and in fact go to many of them on streaming online now a lot of people who go to choral even song and it's not a holy communion service it doesn't raise the question of do you believe in the body and blood and of christ it's an evening prayer service um and it's a with quiet prayers for the evening and god's protection through the night 
and uh, beautiful singing and the singing of the Psalms. And some people who go to it are atheists, but they're inspired by the music. And I wouldn't say to any of them, you shouldn't be here. I, what I'd say is, thank you're very, very welcome. In fact, I try and encourage people to go to it, whatever their belief system. Um, because who knows what will happen through going to choral even song, people may be touched by those prayers, moved by the singing, uh, come to a greater sense of God's reality and presence, and may become more and deeper Christians as a result. Whereas if they're told in the first place, you're not, you know, what right have you got to be here or anything like that, it's going to put them off and it will just mean that, um, you know, the, there's be little way open for people from this godless secular world to find a path back to contact with the Christian tradition. I see this as a way of, uh, I see the many steps on this journey. I've certainly been through quite a lot myself. Um, and the fully committed Christian point of view that you're describing, Paul, which, you know, I'd share much of that view myself, um, is, is, is not the best way in which most people are going to find the Christian faith again. They're, they're, not everyone's going to have a vision of Jesus or that some of them, it'll be a much more gradual process. And that's why I think it's very important to, that the Church of England is an inclusive church. And that's why I very much support that general approach. On our British Pilgrimage Trust, Guided Pilgrimages, we have a slogan that you probably wouldn't like very much called BYOB, Bring Your Own Beliefs. Because um, our point is this is about experience not about belief we don't want people to be put off by people who've had very little contact with the christian tradition know nothing about it can't be expected to sign up to or a belief system um, but they can be expected to enjoy walking through the countryside connecting with the natural world going to an ancient holy place with an intention praying there lighting a candle going to choral even song saying a prayer um, connecting with this heritage and tradition. For many people, that's very, very important. And it goes before a change in their beliefs, not following after a change in their beliefs. Yeah, I completely agree with that, actually. So um, I, I think I'm talking about a different thing. I, maybe I was being unclear. Um, yeah, that's absolutely the case. Um, and that's what I was doing for 20 years. And, uh, you know, it would be the same in the church that I go to. People come to that church and I've taken people to that church who have all sorts of different beliefs or none. And that's how I first went there. So I'm not suggesting for a minute that people shouldn't go to the church and experience it or go on a pilgrimage. Of course, they should. Absolutely. Otherwise, you know, it just becomes a kind of fanatical sect. Yeah, absolutely. What I was talking about was not so much the experience of. Uh, uh, well, not not so much that experience. And I, I'm, I'm totally with you there. It was the it was the. It was probably the second part of what you're talking about there once you if, if you decide to make a commitment to say being a, a christian if you decide to do that which you might not you might want to go to church for 20 years and not make that commitment which is which is fine it's, no one's you know going to stop you coming to experience a liturgy or something but if you decide to say you're a christian i think at that point you know there are definitions that come into play that was the point i was trying to make rather than um because uh, as i say on that on that uh, I agree with you and Philip about that in terms of, you know, the, the experiential nature of this. People get drawn into this very slowly. I think this is what was happening to me for a quarter of a century. I just didn't realise it. So absolutely. Hmm. If you walk into a church and people aren't welcoming and they want to quiz you on your theology, then you're going to be off. So, yes. so that's, that's that. I think we're yeah, probably talking about different things, maybe. Hmm. Another thing it, it might be good to raise is that, I mean, there is controversy, con controversy, controversy about and philosophical debate about the meaning of the word faith and whether the contemporary word belief adequately captures that. So, I mean, Karen Armstrong has argued that historically um, belief had a different meaning. Um, pistis, faith in the New Testament, had more connotations of um, commitment, trust, having your heart in something. And when the Bible was first translated into English, um, she argues that th the word believe um, was much closer to that, related to the, the German word belieben. Um, she quotes Shakespeare, um, now which play is it? I can't recall, but someone saying, believe not by disdain. You know, what does that mean? It means, you know, don't have your heart in your disdain. And then, and then she argues that, you know, as 
so so this was a good translation in in, in the uh it, it, when the bible was originally translated and then as time goes on we have the scientific revolution reformation and belief becomes much more a cold-blooded you know which hypotheses do you intellectually assent to and then she thinks you know it's just a mistranslation now and so we think oh jesus in the gospels really cares about which which hypotheses you assent to whereas um Daniel Howard Schneider, a philosopher, in a paper you can get on his website, Mark and Faith, he has argued that it he focuses on analysis of Mark's gospel, that we should much better understand what Jesus means by faith as something like um, um, perseverance, or um, I can't I think of the word he uses now, but commitment and keeping going. If you look at every time Jesus praises someone's faith, it's they've greatly shown their commitment like the the paralyzed person getting lowered in from the roof or you know the woman with bleeding who you know gets to the front of the crowd um so 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 many philosophers actually many quite in, in many ways quite traditional christian philosophers have argued we shouldn't th so what does belief mean perhaps in the modern sense belief means you're com you're quite confident something's true maybe not certain but you're confident it's true whereas many philosophers have argued no 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 what we should understand by faith is something like um, a, an engaged commitment to that proposition. That's maybe you, you've got to, You can't disbelieve it. You can't think it's false, but you don't have to necessarily be confident it's true either. It's about um, committing to a certain proposition. Uh, Karen Armstrong says we should understand the creed as I commit to the Father, and so on. And uh, there's also an argument, a very good paper by Howard Schneider and somebody else whose name or I forget now argues that this was Mother Teresa's faith. If you, Mother Teresa's diaries, we, 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 we got to look at after she died. He argues that she, she didn't believe Christianity. She had these terrible moments of doubt that she just stopped feeling that it was true, but she still had that deep commitment. And he says, you know, do we want to say she wasn't a Christian? She didn't have faith. So again, it's the two things. Okay. There's, a, there's more of a difficulty with someone who says, I disbelieve it. I think it's false. But for someone who says, I don't know either way, but I'm going to I'm going to live out this commitment to say that person is not a Christian. No, totally. I, I, wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't say they're not a Christian. I mean, that's quite an interesting distinction. I mean, I. I wonder if, yeah, I mean, I wonder if uh, I, th I think I was trying to say this earlier, probably clumsily, but uh, the faith probably comes. The faith may come before the belief. And even if you have the belief in a proposition early on, it's the faith that's going to prove it either way, isn't it? You, you have to follow it. Um, so it's exactly that. You have to choose to walk the path, um, even though you will go through your dark nights of the soul or maybe be unsure or whatever. I mean, it's going to be normal. So, yes, I think that's true. Um, one of the reasons, there are a lot of reasons I became Orthodox, I think um, some of them more explicable than others, but one thing I like about the Eastern Christian tradition is there's a lot less emphasis on theology in the western sense of the word there's much much more emphasis on the the the, the work of the heart the work of the noose as the greeks call it the heart mind um, i mean i asked an orthodox priest once what do you think the difference is between western and eastern christianity and he said the west is here and the east is here in the heart which is a generalization but not a bad one actually because we have spent a lot of time since the reformation arguing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin so that we have got to this point where we think as you say that religion is about complex set of propositions that everybody has to say that they all believe in um, and obviously there has to be a fundamental core that you think you believe in otherwise you wouldn't be going towards the religion in some way um, but the, as i say the eastern tradition is very much more about practice it's very much more about prayer and it's very much more about faith as you've just defined it um, rather than having some uh, that complex theological notion of of what x y or z means as I say, there has to be a core of beliefs that would even make you bother to go to a church in the first place. Um, but beyond that, it is, it's the faith and it's the prayer that sort of matter. Otherwise, what, why would you bother really? There's, it's a practice. One of the things I love about the, the, the church when I first got there, they said, this is a spiritual hospital. And I really loved that phrase. I hadn't heard of it before, the church. And I think I'd probably grown up with the idea that a church is more like a law court where you get judged or a sort of a stage where you get to show off how righteous you are. But they said, no, it's a spiritual hospital. All of this is therapeutic, right? Prayer is therapeutic. The liturgy is therapeutic. We're all, we're all messed up, so we're coming here to heal ourselves. That's the reason we're here on a, on a Sunday morning, not because we're perfect people who have perfect beliefs. Quite the opposite. 
I mean, you, the Christ, when Jesus turns up in the New Testament, he, he explicitly says that he's come to heal all the, come to visit all the sinners and the broken people, as you said at the beginning, not that he doesn't bother with the high and the mighty people. The only time he goes to visit the powerful of the religious or the political establishment is when he goes to have them executed. But that's the, that's the relationship. So it's a, it's, if, when I've heard that notion that the church was a spiritual hospital, it, I, I really that was a very powerful reason for me to, to move towards it. And, and it mm. fits exactly what you, with what you've just said about the faith, the choice to make, to make that sort of, it seems to anyway, to, to make that journey. Oh, we're not agreeing, are we? But but we're well, actually, uh, yeah, on that. But um, there's lots of other things we can argue but, about. <laughs> but just to get just to get just to get totally clear. So when you say there has to be a core of belief, what what if there isn't? What if I just I just don't know either way? But I choose to hope that it's true, and and yeah. I choose to really commit and hope that it's true, even though I just can't say I I I I, I believe. Maybe I'll never believe. But yeah, well, maybe that's depends that, on. Is what that okay? By, yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> You're asking. I'm not a priest. I mean, isn't that what we all do? Because you know, it's. I would, it makes me think of the story of Thomas, you know, the, the, the disciple Thomas, who, who refuses to believe that Jesus has come back from the dead until he can put his fingers in his wounds. Um, I think it's quite a, rational, quite a rational perspective, really. We'd all probably be like that if we'd heard that somebody had just risen from the tomb. So, but he wants to believe it. And in the end, he comes to believe it. Um, we can't see, we can't put our fingers in the wounds. So to some degree, of course, I mean, you know, it's always, a, there's always a hope. There's always a hope. What is... Uh, what exactly does this turn out to be? I, I, I believe in God and I do believe in, in Christ as well, but I don't know exactly what that turns out to be or what happens after death or any of these things. I mean, I, there's lots of theology about it, but we don't know. Nobody knows. So we make a choice to follow a thing that, that's, that we've experienced and that has happened to us and that, that we believe to be true. And as I say, there has to be at some core of something there. Otherwise, we're just that there's nothing. There has to be a faith. Hmm. But also, it's going to be different for everybody, it seems to me. But, you know, I'm, Rupert has been in this for much longer than me, so he can probably say something more useful. Well, I think one one area that the um, where this is focused, focused on, and one of the themes underlying this discussion really is, uh, what about people who have spiritual practices without a religious faith? That, there's a lot of people in Britain who call themselves spiritual but not religious. And many of them practice yoga, meditation, and a number of other spiritual practices. And I've written two entire books on spiritual practices, one science and spiritual practices, and the other ways to go beyond and why they work, each one dealing with seven different spiritual practices, all of which are traditionally done within the framework of religions, but in the modern world, uh, are done by some people outside that context. For example, meditation, yoga, fasting. Um, some people go on pilgrimages without belief, singing and chanting, which are very powerfully transformative. They're part of every religion. But my wife, Jill Purse, gives singing and chanting workshops. Most of the people who go to them have no, they're spiritual but not religious or non-religious. Um, and they come out of the workshops glowing, having had this wonderful experience. Now, you can do quite a lot of these spiritual practices without a religious practice, uh, framework. But where I think the difference is highlighted is in the difference between meditation and prayer. When I first did Transcendental Meditation in Cambridge, the person teaching it said, you don't need to believe anything to do this, just do this, and you'll notice within 20 minutes that your mind has changed, and do it regularly, and you'll notice a real change. It's about physiology, changes in the brain, heartbeat, you know, some, you know the relaxation, etc. cetera. Um, now, that's, I believe in, I think meditation is a very valuable practice. I do it every morning in a Christian form. Um, and what that does is sort of, withdraw from the world and you come to this practice which brings you to the ground of consciousness itself um, and the meditation practices exist in all traditions contemplative prayer it's called usually in the christian tradition but petitionary prayer the ordinary common or garden kind of prayer where you're praying for some you know to get better or for protection from some danger that kind of prayer involves Point, directing attention outwards to events in the world and in one's life and in the world around one. And in a sense, it's the opposite of meditation. Meditation is like breathing in. You're letting go of everything outside, coming to the ground of consciousness. Petitionary prayer starts with an invocation 
Our Father, who art in heaven, Hail Mary, full of grace. Um, in every religion, the prayers start with an invocation. You connect with that spiritual source. And then you're, you, you, with that spiritual source, you direct these intentions to the outer world, connecting them with the spiritual source. In that sense, it's like breathing out as opposed to breathing in. And I think we need both. But the, my point here in relation to faith is that you can't pray if you're an atheist and you believe there's nothing out there, all consciousness is inside the head. The entire universe is made up of unconscious matter, purposeless matter, which is totally devoid of any form of consciousness. And there's no such thing as God, saints or angels out there. They're all figments, of our imagination inside our head. That would make it very, very hard to pray. To pray, you have to take the leap of faith that there is something to which you're praying, a being, a greater being than yourself. And it could be God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus Christ. It could be the Blessed Virgin, the Mother of God. It could be the angels. It could be the saints. There's many options for prayer, but all of them involve addressing a being of a greater level of consciousness than one's own. And to, to be able to pray, you have to, at least for the time you're praying, make that leap of faith that you're not just saying words inside your head that are just echoing in, in a, inside your skull. They're contacting something beyond you. And through that leap of faith, through that actual act of faith, rather, in, in praying, um, there's very often, I find, a sense of connection that, that makes it very real to you that you are part of a greater consciousness. Uh, than than yourself and your own. So I think that that's a way in which faith becomes a, a practical matter, a, a practical matter as part of an everyday um, spiritual or religious practice, and one which doesn't require sort of endless tormented uh, sort of vexations about what do I mean by this and what I mean. It's just a practical thing. If you're going to pray, then you start by saying Our Father or Hail Mary or something like that. Uh, you start with an invocation. And that is the faith that makes the prayer possible. 100%. Well, Rupert, I think that's a great, a great note to end on. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, before, before we end this, you know, you're all, all three of your authors. Um, so I just want to maybe if anybody wants to do some follow up reading after, after seeing this or he, listening to this, this, uh, this episode, um, could you maybe tell us a bit about your books? Um, I think Paul and Philip, you're currently working on, on a new book. Is that right? And obviously not together, um, but you're working, you're working on new books. And <laughs> really Rupert, you've got you've got two books in spiritual practice as well. Maybe if you, if you want to tell us about your books and where people can can get them online. Okay, well, I'll very briefly say something about three books. First, the Science Delusion. This is the new 2020 edition, which goes, as I mentioned earlier, the ten dogmas of of um, contemporary materialistic science. Uh, showing how if you turn the dogmas into hypotheses, instead of saying nature, matter is unconscious, you say, you turn it into a question, is matter unconscious? Then all sorts of possibilities open up. If you, instead of saying nature is purposeless, you say, is nature purposeless? And you look at the evidence one way or the other and discuss it one way or the other. It becomes much more interesting. Science becomes so much more interesting when they're questions, not dogmas, which they usually are. And then I already mentioned my book, Science and Spiritual Practices, which has chapters on seven practices, um, meditation, gratitude, connecting with nature, relating to plants, singing and chanting, rituals, and pilgrimage, all of them part of religions, but some of which can be done without being part of a religious framework. And then seven more in ways to go beyond and why they work. Um, starting uh, with sports, which I think is the most common but underappreciated spiritual practice in the modern world. It brings people into the present. If you're halfway up a rock face, you're totally in the present. Your mind isn't wandering, is it? You know, the whole point of meditation is to bring you into the present. And if you're in the engaged in some sporting activity, the default mode network, the ruminations and anxieties and stuff are shut off in the brain, you're completely present. And I think that's why sport is so popular in, a in the secular world, because it brings people into the present. The second chapter, Learning from Animals, 
is again uh, because I think that keeping dogs and cats, which are much more in the present than we are, is a way in which millions of people find they're brought into the present by their dog or cat, uh, which isn't worrying about whether it's paid the gas bill and that kind of thing. It's it, you know, they can be a purring cat, a, a dog wanting you to throw sticks totally in the present. Then um, fasting present in many uh, traditions. I myself fast in Lent every year, just water and tea, um, not for the whole of Lent, for four or five days. But the, this can be done as a purely secular health related uh, detox. And it is that. Uh, but it can also be done as part of the liturgy, as part of the cycle of Holy Week. I do it in Holy Week leading up to Easter. Um, uh, I have a chapter on spiritual openings through cannabis and psychedelics because I believe in the modern world for many people um, these substances provide gateways, they're gateways to a more spiritual view of the world, a greater sense of our own consciousness. Um, I, I have chapters on holy days and festivals because they're ways in which bring all societies have them as a way of celebrating together. Um, uh, my last chapter is on uh, avoiding bad habits, cultivating good habits and being kind, really on the virtues and vices. Um, the vices are bad habits, virtues are good habits, as Aristotle pointed out. That's what they are. We can cultivate them. And most important of all is being kind. And that's why spiritual practices are important, because they give us a sense of connection. If we feel more connected, more kin, with nature and with other people we're more likely to be kind because uh, it affects us more than if we think we're separate alienated and separate um so um those are those are my the three most relevant books to this discussion thank you very much rupert uh so paul or philip do you want to tell us about about your books um well i've written uh, i've written nine books but i'm not going to list them all <laughs> i actually haven't written any books um which is which directly address um, what we're talking about here, partly because of my kind of fairly new movement towards it. So maybe I will one day when I have something I can usefully say. What I am doing at the moment is I'm writing a series of essays on Substack, which is called The Abbey of Misrule. Uh, and I'm talking about a lot of this on there, actually. I mean, it started off as a fairly uh, political and cultural series of essays, but it seems to be getting dragged into the into the spiritual realm, whether I like it or not. And I'm talking a lot about this because much of what I've I, I'm trying to write about the, the the state of the world at the moment and and where we're going, and and much of it comes back down to this sense that we're in a society that can't last because of its its lack of a spiritual core, and so what that means and where we're going. So I, I'm sort of digging into that, and I'm writing an essay every two or three weeks. Um, so that's called the Abbey of Misrule. Otherwise, I have a website, paulkingsnorth.net, which has got the details of my past books on it as well. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Paul. And Philip? Yeah, so I've written, I mean, I guess I wrote, I started, wrote an academic book on consciousness, consciousness and fundamental reality, which is maybe quite challenging if you don't have the sort of philosophical academic back, academic philosophy background. But then I wrote, I didn't have a book to hand, but I just spied a copy, aimed at a general audience, Galileo's error foundations for a new science of consciousness and i suppose that's um tracing the problem of consciousness back to the way we design science the way galileo in particular designed science at the start of the scientific revolution or near the start uh, in such a way as to exclude consciousness so that we can have a purely mathematical science and now we're thinking oh no how come we can't explain consciousness and i'm arguing that that's kind of the way it was set up in the first place. Um, so we really sort of need to rethink what science is to deal with consciousness. And ultimately I defend a panpsychist theory of consciousness, roughly kind of consciousness is, is everywhere at the fundamental level of reality. So rather than trying to explain how, how consciousness emerges from matter, we instead try to explain how matter emerges from underlying facts about consciousness. A view that was ridiculed for a long time, but is increasingly being taken seriously in, in academic philosophy, and I'm one of the people pressing that. But in the book I'm currently working on, maybe a little bit closer to the, our current topic, so I'm arguing um, for cosmic purpose, but in the absence of the traditional God. So I, get, I think I'm sort of quite impressed both by the arguments for God and the arguments against. I think there are, there, there are very good reasons to take seriously that there is some kind of 
goal directedness at the, the fundamental level of reality, um, the, the fine tuning of physics, this recent discovery, you know, that, that, that for life to be possible, certain numbers in physics had to fall in a very narrow range. And it, on the face of it, it's incredibly improbable that you just get the right numbers by chance. I kind of think as a society, we're sort of in denial about that. Um, it sort of doesn't fit with how we got used to thinking about science, just as when we first got evidence that the earth wasn't in the center of the universe, people sort of couldn't handle that because it didn't fit with how they got used to thinking about, about reality. And we sort of think, oh, they were very silly. We're much more enlightened now. But I kind of think it's the same with fine tuning. You know, you, people don't know about this. You never hear it talked about on Brian Cox science shows, you know, just I find talking to people, you know, so I think I sort of think we're, we will look back and think it a bit odd that we sort of ignored this very important finding in physics that I do think points to cosmic purpose. At the same time, as I've talked about, I don't believe in the traditional God. So I'm exploring various hypotheses for making sense of cosmic purpose without God. And I'm um, that middle ground between God and atheism that's so neglected. I think we get in these dichotomies, you know, are you a communist or a capitalist? Are you, you know, do you believe Dawkins or the Pope? You know, so I'm exploring the middle ground and, you know, what implications human cosmic purpose has for human existence. And that should be out some at some point next year. Hopefully, if all goes according to plan. I always like to argue about things on Twitter. Philip underscore Goff, Philip with one L. Um, spend too much time arguing on Twitter, but that's probably where I'm mostly found when I should be writing. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you for sharing. And I just want to say a huge thank you to all three of you for taking the time this evening to uh, to share your perspectives. You're all coming from a very different background, but I think there was there was so much value in what each of, each of you shared. So thank you very much. And I wish you the best of luck with your with your work and everything going forward.